guys, I figured that I close out vlog summer this year with uh, yet another read along video. And this time, the book I'm going to be reading to you guys is Manhattan Mapping the Story of an Island by Jennifer Thermes. Hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Apologies if I'm not. Millions of years ago, when the glaciers melted, before anything had a name, the island lay sheltered in an estuary where freshwater river met saltwater sea, anchored on bedrock far below the surface of the earth. Summers were steamy, winters were cold, wind blew in from the ocean nearby, and sunshine and rain were abundant. On the land, in the air, and beneath the sparkling waters, the island bubbled with life. The Lenape lived on the island for thousands of years. They called it Manhattan, which means island of many hills. In groups called clans, they moved from beach to meadow to forest as the seasons changed, living in villages with names like Sapokanakan and Shurikapak. The Lenape hunted, fished, farmed, and foraged for food, using what they needed, and nothing more. They feasted on oysters that grew in beds by the millions and carved wampum beads from the pearl-like insides for trading with other native people. The tides flowed in and out for generations and the island thrived. In 1609, an Englishman named Henry Hudson sailed his ship, the Half Moon, upriver past the island. He was looking for a way to get to China, but when he saw the deep harbor, tall trees, and boundless wildlife, he told his Dutch employer back home about the island's riches. The island was about to change. Once, almost 60 million beavers lived on and around the island's waterways. They felled small trees with their sharp front teeth and built dams made of branches and mud to stop water from flowing. This created rich wetland habits, habitats for other plants and animals. Meanwhile, back in Europe, warm hats made from beaver pelts were the height of fashion. The business of trapping beavers in the New World grew quickly. They were soon overhunted and completely gone from the island by the 1800s. The Dutch claimed the island's tiny southern point as their own and built a town for trading furs. They brought 11 enslaved African people to do the heavy labor of carving canals through the land and building a fort and a wall for protection. Immigrants from around the world came to live and work since few Dutch citizens wanted to leave the comforts of home in the Netherlands for an outpost in the middle of nowhere. It was said that 18 different languages were spoken on the island at that time, but in just 40 years, the island would change hands again. As the story goes, Peter Minuit, the director general of New Amsterdam, working for the Dutch West India Company, bought this island for, from the Lenape in 1626 for approximately, for approximately $24 worth of wampum beads and trinkets. For native people, the idea of someone owning the land was as crazy as owning the air we breathe. More likely, the Lenape thought they were only agreeing to share the island with the Dutch. American Indians had traded with Europeans in the years before Hudson's arrival, but conflicts arose once a permanent settlement was established. After years of broken treaties and brutal massacres, the Lenape were, for were forced off the island by the end of the 17th century. Let's 
see what we can find here. Ah, there's Broadway, Road to New Harlem. And there's the wall. That's where Wall Street's name comes from. Up and down the coast of North America, Europeans were colonizing the land. Soon, England wanted the island for its own. After fighting back and forth, the Dutch finally agreed to hand it over. The town on the island was renamed New York for King Charles II's brother, the Duke of York. Business continued to grow. Merchants and members of the gentry purchased properties along the shore called water lots to build wharves, docks, and slips for tall sailing ships. The canals were filled in and the land was expanded into the East River by filling it with rocks and earth, broken, cork, cr broken crockery, oyster shells, wood from old shipwrecks, rotten garbage, and even dead animals. From the start, the brutal practice of buying, selling, and trading human beings from Africa and the Caribbean was a part of New York's business. Under Dutch rule, some enslaved people could purchase limited freedom for themselves, but the English were harsher and revoked many of their rights. The Collect Pond sat north of the city, fed by an underground spring. It was a kettle pond, scooped out from the land when the glacier that covered the island retreated more than 20,000 years earlier. It was the island's best source of fresh water. Two streams flowing from its east and west sides sometimes overflowed and split the island in half. For centuries, the area was home to the Lenape village of Werpos. By the 1700s, Free Africans li lived nearby. In those days, black people were not allowed to be buried in the public cemetery at Trinity Church since it was inside city limits, so they lay their loved ones to rest near the pond's edge. As the city on the island grew, breweries, tanneries, and slaughterhouses moved next to the pond. They dumped foul waste in its clear waters. A canal was dug to try to drain the putrid mess into the Hudson River, but the rise and fall of tides only sloshed the filthy water around. The stench was unbearable. In time, the city decided to fill the pond and canal. The canal became Canal Street. They built fancy homes on top of what was once the pond and called it Paradise Square. But soon, gas from the decomposing landfill gurgled up. Buildings tilted and sank in the mud. The rich moved out and poor people moved in. By the mid-1800s, the neighborhood became known as Five Points for the five streets that crossed the area. A jail called the Tombs was built nearby. Gangs roamed the streets. Murder and mayhem ruled. Some tried to make Five Points a better place for the people who lived there, but once again, the city tore everything down. In 1991, while excavating for a new federal office building, construction workers discovered human bones. They had stumbled upon the old African burial ground, covered and forgotten near the pond long ago. In 2006, it was declared a national monument. In time, the colonists grew tired of unfair British laws and taxes. They wanted independence from England. Revolution broke out, and the British army quickly captured the city on the island. They would occupy it for seven, for seven long years. Almost immediately, a mysterious fire burned one quarter of the city to the ground. No one really knows who said it. About half of the island's people left for safer places. Two winters were so cold that the water froze solid in New York Harbor. 
Thousands of prisoners died from disease and starvation in dank prison ships. Many of the island's ancient trees were chopped down for firewood, fences, and ship masts. But when the war finally ended, a new country had been born. The United States of America. The city on the island would be the official national capital for almost two years before it was changed to Philadelphia and finally Washington, D.C. On April 30th, 1789, George Washington was sworn in as the first president of the United States at Federal Hall. He noted that New York City was tiny compared to Boston and Philadelphia. Tis but a city in the wilderness, said George. Gotta wet my whistle for a bit. Soon, thousands of people returned to the island. There was much rebuilding to be done. Shipbuilders, sailmakers, carpenters, blacksmiths, and all kinds of artisans crowded the city again. Taverns and coffee houses reopened for business. Fish markets and oyster saloons lined the wharves. Even more land was added to the waterfront, and some streets were renamed so as not to remind New Yorkers of England. It was a time of industry, growth, and freedom, but not for everyone. The city on the island was branching out in all directions. It needed a plan. Slavery continued in New York City after the American Revolution. Soon, there were almost as many enslaved people on the island as in the southern city of Charleston, South Carolina. Most wealthy New Yorkers owned at least one person. The city was rebuilt using slave labor and immigrants, who began coming to the island in larger numbers. With money loaned from newly formed banks on Wall Street, merchant families grew even wealthier, trading cotton from the South, sugar from Caribbean plantations, and human beings, all shipped in and out of New York Harbor to around the world. A special city commission hired John Randall Jr. to survey the island. With his team, Randall mapped and measured every hill, swamp, stream, tree, and rock. Sometimes, he was forced to hack his way through the wildest parts of the island with an axe. Unlike other cities designed on a grid, the commissioner's plan ignored the island's rolling land and rambling waters. Though it would change over the years, the original plan was all straight lines and squared corners. For the next decade, Randall and his assistants pounded more than 1,600 marble monuments and iron bolts into the ground to mark the roads that would be built. Boom, blast, scrape and shovel. Workmen leveled the island's hills. New roads were dug out, raised up, and pounded flat. Old roads were straightened and widened. Rubble from the construction filled the island's marshes, creeks, and meadows. Any house in the way of the grid had to be moved out or torn down. Had to be moved or torn down. Farmland was divided and sold off. Poor people living on the outskirts of the city were forced out as the grid crept north. Edgar Allan Poe wrote his famous poem, The Raven, while living in the old Brennan farmhouse at what is now 84th Street and Broadway. He despaired at the noise and ruin of the island's natural beauty. But, as with any change, everyone had a different opinion about the grid. Some declared it to be dull. Others thought it was easier to find one's way, with newly numbered streets and walkable distances. Some said the equal-sized building lots would make housing affordable for all. Even more people could fit on the island. A few would grow very wealthy buying and selling the land. 
The city commissioners had thought it would take centuries to fill the grid with buildings. It only took 60 years. The Great Fire of 1835 started in a warehouse one frigid December night and burned for two days, destroying the downtown business district. Fire brigades chopped holes through the frozen East River to reach water, but they couldn't pump enough. Meanwhile, dark and airless tenement houses designed to squeeze in as many immigrant families as possible were under constant threat of fire, and little of the island's water was fit to drink. Between brackish wells, mosquitoes, and overcrowding diseases like cholera, yellow fever, and smallpox were rampant. The city desperately needed clean water. In 1842, a new system called the Croton Aqueduct opened to great celebration. Water from 30 miles north of the city flowed by gravity using aqueducts like those of ancient Rome. Though the problem of what to do with human excrement uh, and streets full of horse manure still remained, good drinking water and indoor plumbing were a miracle for those who could afford it. By the 1840s, around 300,000 people were packed on the island, most below 23rd Street. The grid had left little room for open space. The city was so crowded that people visited Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn just to find some peace and quiet and nature to enjoy. It was time to build a park. After some debate, the city leaders chose land in the center of the island and held a contest to design the park. The Greens were planned by Frederick Law by Frederick Law Olmsted. The Greens were planned by Frederick Law Olmsted and Cav and Calvert Vaux won. Olmsted and Vaux wanted to build a place full of nature and beauty for all the people of New York City, and it would encourage people to move uptown. Stonecutters, masons, gardeners, carpenters, blacksmiths, artisans, architects, and immigrant day laborers worked to transform the, ro the rocky, swampy land. They planted rows of 20-year-old elm trees, along with thousands of other trees and shrubs. Stone streams and soil were rearranged, and pipes were laid for waterways. Transverse roads to cross the park from the east and west sides were built. Everything had its own special place in the design. In 1825, as the grid was moving north, a young freed African-American man purchased the first lot of land from a farmer selling off parcels of his estate. Soon others followed. The place became known as Seneca Village. It was one of the island's first middle-class African-American communities. With fresh air, fine water, and a short walk to the Hudson River to fish and swim, it was far enough from the city that its residents could live away from the discrimination they faced every day. By 1827, slavery had been outlawed in New York State, but only men with at least $250 worth of property were allowed to vote in elections. It was a staggering amount of money back then and made it impossible for all people to have a say in their government. So most important, the owning of land gave the men of Seneca Village the right to vote. But when the city decided to build Central Park, it wanted Seneca Village's land. The people protested. Newspapers called them scornful names such as squatters and their village, a shanty town, even though it had almost 300 residents working as farmers, domestics, laundresses, blacksmiths, and more, plus three churches and one school. Finally, in 1857, using a law called eminent domain, the city paid each landowner a tiny sum of money and tore the village down. Families lost their homes and were forced to leave. It was not peaceful. No one really knows where the people of Seneca Village went. 
Perhaps some moved even farther north to Harlem or left the island completely. In recent years, the cornerstone from a church foundation was found in Central Park, where Seneca Village once stood. As with the African burial ground, discoveries about the history of Black people in the city on the island and the places they lived remain to be made. Their stories are still unfolding. When it was complete, Central Park was 843 acres of nature transformed. Olmsted and Vaux's vision was a masterpiece. It had lakes for rowing boats, bridal paths for riding, and footpaths for people to stroll. It was a place to promenade by horse and carriage on a sunny afternoon. There were woods to ramble through, birds to watch, waterfalls, bridges, a sheep meadow, and a castle. There was a brand new reservoir for the city's water. The park wasn't quite as accessible to all as Olmsted and Vaux had hoped. Five cents each way by horse car and a long trip uptown made it difficult for working class people to enjoy it as often as they might have wanted. But still, Central Park was a refuge from the tensions of city life. Where the grid was laid out for business and growth, the park was designed with curves, as they occur in nature, for people to wander, think, and dream. Give me a sec, I'm just admiring all, all the artwork on this page. And this is what I'm marveling at. In 1890 and 1891, Eugene Schoff, ah, hang on, hard to pronounce the name. Eugene Schieffelin released a few dozen starlings into the park so that people could see the birds that Shakespeare wrote about. Starlings now number in the millions. In the 1930s, sheep really did graze in sheep meadow. Millions of years ago, the Laurentide ice sheet covered the island and surrounding areas. When it finally melted, rubble was left scattered across the land. These random rocks are called glacial erratics. Some can be seen in the park today. A red-tailed hawk named Pale Male became famous in the early 1990s for nesting on the ledge of an apartment building overlooking Central Park. Belvedere Castle sits atop Vista Rock, a 400 million year old outcropping of Manhattan schist that peaks above ground and is part of the solid bedrock far below the island. Central Park's elm trees are watched closely for signs of Dutch elm disease, a fungus that wiped out millions of American elm trees in the 20th century. Montaigne's rivulet flows through the lock and can be seen on Egbert Veal's 1874 map of the island's original waterways. Builders still use his map today when planning new construction projects. Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins wanted to build a giant model dinosaur exhibition for Central Park, but he angered a powerful and corrupt politician named Boss Tweed who had the models destroyed. Rumor has it, the dinosaurs are buried somewhere under the park. Central Park is a resting spot for migrating birds along the route of the Atlantic Flyway, which makes it a perfect spot for bird watching. In 1937, the Great Lawn was built on top of the reservoir that once held the city's water. It was filled in with rubble excavated from the foundation of Rockefeller Center and the 8th Avenue Subway Tunnel. The Erie Canal opened in 1825, 
When Governor DeWitt Clinton proposed the idea for a canal, many thought it was a folly, but it meant that clothing, food, furniture, and more could be set up the Hudson River, could be sent up the Hudson River and floated by barge to the Midwest without having to cross the Appalachian Mountains. The canal made New York City the, indu the industrial capital of the country. Working class people toiled long hours in dangerous conditions in the city's sweatshops and factories. Women were paid less than half of what men earned for the same labor. Children worked too. Tragedies like the 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which killed more than 100 young women, led to reform movements and the creation of unions that helped protect workers' rights. When the Civil War began, the city's merchants didn't want to fight the South for fear of losing money from the cotton trade, but eventually, New York joined the cause to end slavery. Outside, the clip-clop noise of horse hooves on pavement and the shouts of newsboys hawking their papers filled the air. Steam-powered vessels and packet ships jostled for space in the, la for s jostled for space in the harbor. Inside, the whir of sewing machines and the labor of both the New York City-born and the newly arrived fueled commerce in the city on the island. Millions of people from around the world have been coming to the island since Europeans first landed in North America. Fleeing famine and turmoil in their home countries, they first landed on docks in the East River, then at Castle Garden, and finally Ellis Island. Sometimes older groups of immigrants forgot that they were once new, too, and sometimes ugly laws were passed to keep the new ones out. But immigrants helped build the city on the island, doing jobs that others didn't want in search of a better life. They are still what make the city on the island unique today. Uptown Fifth Avenue became known as Millionaire's Row. Businesses boomed with money made from railroad steel and speculation. Wealth was also inherited from the fur trade and passed down through families. Mansions were built, torn down a few years later, and rebuilt even bigger. It was said that a person returning to the city after 10 years away would find it to be completely new. Downtown, the entire world could be found living side by side in immigrant neighborhoods. Language, food, music, and cultures mixed. The writer Mark Twain called this era the Gilded Age for its immense ex excess of wealth and greed. It was a time of sharp contrast between those who had more than they needed and those who got by with very little. By the late 1800s, elevated trains, the L, chugged up and down avenues and over busy streets lined with restaurants, shops, and music halls. Electric wires and telephone lines crisscrossed the island. Lights blazed day and night. The city on the island never slept. But when the great blizzard of 1888 hit, all came to a halt. Wind, ice, and snow slammed into the island, toppling poles, tangling wires, and cutting off communication with the outside world. Water and gas pipes froze, leaving homes without steam heat. The L stopped running, and 15,000 passengers were stranded on the tracks overhead. Some people, caught outside the, some people caught outside in the storm found refuge in hotels and department stores. Others were not so lucky. Giant snowdrifts buried humans and animals discovered only after everything thawed. New York City was now home to more than one million people who relied on electricity and transportation to live. It was more vulnerable than ever to natural disasters. It was time to go underground.
The first subway opened in 1904, running from City Hall Station in Lower Manhattan all the way to 42nd Street. Eventually, the tracks would cover more than 840 miles beneath the city. It was a marvel. There were local and express trains, and the price to ride was the same for everyone, whether traveling five blocks or the entire length of the island. Meanwhile, the city on the island was spreading out. Bridges and tunnels and highways, which would be built in years to come, connected the island to surrounding communities and led people to live in the suburbs, commuting to New York City for work. On January 1st, 1898, the five boroughs, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island, joined together to become Greater New York one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the world. Behold the bridges. Throughout the 20th century, the city on the island grew up. Steel replaced buildings made of wood, brick, stone, and cast iron. The invention of the elevator's safety brig prevented elevators from crashing to the ground and meant that buildings could grow even taller. They were called skyscrapers, named for the top sail of tall ships, which seemed to touch the sky. Mohawk iron workers from upstate New York and Canada worked on most of the island's bridges and buildings over the years. Hundreds of feet up in the air, legend was that they had little fear of heights. Today, skyscrapers come in all shapes, sizes, and structures. Skinny, boxy, shiny, curvy, and covered in glass. And they are still constantly under construction. On October 29, 2012, Hurricane Sandy barreled up the East Coast and crashed onto the island with wind, rain, and a 14-foot storm surge that inundated Battery Park. Seawater from the island's deep harbor poured into subways and tunnels. An electric power station flooded, plunging the lower part of Manhattan into darkness. Before humans built land out of fill and covered the island with concrete, Salt marshes, meadows, streams, and even oyster beds absorbed and drained high waters and buffered the island from erosion. Land that has been covered over isn't sheltered from bad weather the way nature intended. Because it sits on the coast near the Atlantic Ocean, the island is even more, mul is even more vulnerable to the powerful storms and rising sea levels of global climate change. Protecting it from water will be the century's greatest challenge. Once again, it is time for a plan. Today, at just over 13 miles long and just under two and a half miles at its widest point, the island is home to 1.6 million people. Add those who commute in and out of New York City for work, and almost 4 million people walk on its land during the week. The city on the island will always have problems to solve, but people from every country on Earth are still drawn to the, sl the sliver of land where river meets sea. And reminders are everywhere that...
through centuries of constant change. Humans and nature will always exist together, and beneath the city's concrete crust, the island endures. By 2007, after years of efforts to clean up water polluted by industry, beavers began returning to the Bronx River for the first time in more than 200 years. Images of beavers can be found on plaques and carvings all around the island today, including on the official seal of New York City. The tree in the oval frame appearing throughout this book is an English elm tree known as the hangman's elm. It was likely planted by a landowner on a farm around the time the British took over the island from the Dutch. It still stands today in Washington Square Park. At almost 350 years old, it is possibly the island's oldest tree. Rumor has it that traders were hanged from the elm's branches during the Revolutionary War, which is how it got its name, but no actual records of hangings exist. However, a gallows where executions did take place once stood nearby. Hundreds of years ago, Washington Square Park was a swampy meadow. The Mineta stream flowed through it. The Lenape village of, of Sapokanakin spoke nearby, of Sapokanakin sat nearby. Later, farms, country homes, and churches dotted the landscape. In 1797, the city purchased the land for use as a potter's field. The poor criminals, enslaved people, the unknown, and victims of the city's yellow fever epidemics were buried there over the years. An estimated 20,000 remains are still deep beneath the park today and are sometimes discovered during construction projects. In 1827, the city paved over the potter's field and used it as a military parade ground. Finally, it became a public park named after George Washington. The hangman's elm has survived countless storms and Dutch elm disease. It was also just plain lucky. It grew on land that happened to be sold to the city when Washington Square Park was expanded, protecting it from new roads and buildings. With any luck, the tree will witness even more history from years to come. It is a living reminder that the island is full of hidden stories. All we have to do is look around. And that is the end. Hope you enjoyed this video. And I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to the history of Manhattan. And that is it for Vlogsember. Bye.